Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 374 for Sunday, February 19th, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsor, Our sponsor for this episode is Banzoogle, where you can go to banzoogle.com and use promo code GIGGAB to get 15% off your first year of any subscription. Paul and I both use Banzoogle with our bands. We'll talk a little bit more about the details of that later in the episode. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, uh... Happy anniversary, Paul. Happy anniversary, Dave. Eight great years. Eight years of bending your ears, folks. Yep, today, it's <laughs> it's, it's actually today. And I don't, I, I, I at least didn't intentionally schedule to record on a Sunday because I knew today was the anniversary day. It was more the way our schedules evolved, I think. Uh, so, but, but I, I'm glad. Serendipity, here we are. So, I like it. Here we are. Yeah. You have a better brain for this stuff than me. Do you remember what we talked about in our first episode? No. I don't. Um, we should I mean, post the first episode again. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it's up there. You, you, it's, it's, it's there for we the world. We share it on social. But yeah, yeah. I, I have not listened to the first episode in a while. Um, yeah. And actually, I don't know. I should look. I don't know if anyone has ever heard what we called episode one. Um, did did because you and I did a couple of episodes as sort of a. Um, you know, dry run to get our, to get our legs under us, if you will. Oh, before we actually created a social page and that stuff. Right? Well, before we ever released a, an episode. Uh, so yeah, I don't, that's interesting. So you do remember. Well, I remember, I remember th that we, I, like what I'm, my question is, did we call the first episode that we released episode one? And I, as I'm vamping here, no, no one's ever heard episode one other than you and me. The uh, the the first episode that was released was actually episode two, so you got to post one now. You just have to. Yeah, I don't know that one. I'm sure it exists in my archives somewhere. I don't. I don't know that we. I don't know that we have to post one. I, I would. I would listen to it first before we decide. <laughs> that. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Fair well, enough. we just. I mean, we had never done a podcast together before. So the the way you you learn to do that is you you know you you just go and record. And we recorded, our plan was to record until we felt comfortable releasing it. And evidently that happened didn't take long. <laughs> the second time. Yeah, exactly. Right. But it certainly did not happen the first time. So maybe there was Probably. a reason for that. Maybe the first one was a lot of testing. One, two, three. It like, might've been. Just a yeah. Testing. Technical, testing. Technical. Yeah. Test, 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 test tube si siblings, test tube siblings. Right. That's what you're supposed to say into the microphone. Right. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, this, this show is a, obviously a collaboration with, with you and me and all of us here. Like, it, you folks are very involved in what this show is. You send in your thoughts to us at feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And we, uh, you know, we react to those. We share those. We answer questions if they're questions. We share your thoughts. And, and I was thinking about the, the value. I was reminded of the value of collaboration yet again today, it, we had a bitter pill rehearsal just a couple of hours ago, uh, right here in, in, in my studio. And it was our first rehearsal in a while. We had intentionally taken a couple of months, uh, to, to just like, you know, collect our thoughts. There was no, no issues in the band. Well, I mean, technically, I guess there, it wasn't an issue. Our, our banjo player, uh, Mike said that he, he quit. And then today he, he came to rehearsal. So, uh, we explained to him, look, man, you know, in these in these last couple of months, a lot has changed. And he's like, you mean in the last couple of months when you guys didn't get together at all? Like, look, man, that that's 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 on us. You don't know anything about that. He lives uh, with Emily, our singer. So, you know, he knows everything about. The band. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but we we started working on as we do at Bitter Pill Rehearsal. You know, we got together. We we got our sound dialed in. We played a, a song that that effectively was our sound check, a song that we've been playing for years so that we could, you know, just like be bitter pill together. And, and I think I've said before, 
it, with Bitter Pill, it takes us a little while at each rehearsal to really get into what I'll call creative mode, where, where we're like truly productive on whatever new material we're working on. It, it took less time today than it usually takes, which I, which I don't, I don't know what that means, but it was certainly fine. Um, but we wound up, you know, we wound up, uh, working on a bunch of new tunes, a couple of covers that, that are like a doc Watson cover. And I forget who does the other one that we did, but, um, but we also started working on some, uh, originals that, uh, I guess that, that, that Emily wrote. And one of them is tune Daisy. We had messed with, I don't know, a year and a half ago, I think. And it just, it never stuck. And today we started playing through it. And, and I heard, it's like, it could be a really like ballady song, just acoustic guitar and, and vocal, right? Like it would work that way. But as we were playing it and we, and we had sort of decided, you know, a year and a half ago or whatever, that that's just what it would be. And it never really took off from there. So today, as we were messing with it, I, I, for whatever reason, I heard that it could have like a drive to it. Like there, this could be a higher energy song. And so I just started kind of letting my hands do things and, uh, and just, you know, experimenting with rhythms and starting to do stuff. And it's like, okay, yeah, I see where this is going. And then I don't know, halfway through the tune or whatever, we had to stop for whatever reason, maybe it was because of me or maybe it was something else. And, Mike and then Billy, Mike, our banjo player, our new banjo player, the latest member of, of Bitter Pill. Uh, as of today, he joined the band yet again. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he was like, what, what are you, what you're doing there? Isn't that's not working for me. And I'm like, okay, like, that's fine. I said, I, I'm not married to this. I said, but it, it I, I don't, it shouldn't be what, like, I don't think the drum part, I don't think the best like version of this song is the drum part being just like, a really laid back thing. I said, I think there's something to this. I don't know what it is yet, you know? And um, so he and I sort of talked through it. He shared some ideas. Everybody like shared ideas and, um, and we played it again. And I was like, okay, it's getting somewhere. Okay. You know, something. And then Billy had the idea, well, play, you know, play the snare half as much as you are. Like, like um, in terms of backbeats, uh, there was some syncopation I was doing on the snare, but you know, in terms of backbeats, he effectively, said play at halftime, although he didn't quite say it that way. I was like, well, I'm playing the hi-hat in like this, this sort of implying double time. If I play the snare halftime, so I tried it. And as soon as we got into it, it was like, oh, now this, like to me as a drummer, feels like a second line kind of thing because it's got mm. these two grooves sort of happening. But, but it really, like as soon as we all heard it, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we finished the song. They're like, okay, that, this is like getting somewhere. I'm like, yeah, wait, wait we got to roll tape here because I will never remember what I just played. This is not a part that I would come up with. So if I, if it leaves my brain, it's not just going to naturally it's come gone back. Forever. Yeah. yeah. It's gone forever. And uh, so obviously we did, you know, we did record it and thankfully we recorded it in two different ways. Cause one of the recordings I've, I've since been told uh, was nada. So uh, I, hopefully what I have here works, but um, yeah, yeah, but it, you know, it's cool. just, you know, that's, it reminded me of the value band. of collaboration. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say that, you know, it's, it's a band vibe. It's a, it's a thin line between people telling other people what to play and of, of a vibe of trust yes. where you group problem solve together. Yeah. That's what it was. It was just like, I'm going to not just... every song sounds right in every band's hands, right? You no. know, original or cover. Correct. And sometimes you got to find the, you know, the essence of something that matches the, all the individual styles that you have. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a thing, you know, it's a thing. I, I have the, I have the other side of it where I have this group now down here in Napomo that, uh, we just added a piano player. So serendipitously someone I went to high school with who I knew well in high school, really haven't, haven't been in touch, not even Facebook in touch. And then I saw he was looking for on Facebook. I saw he was looking for a new home down here. And so I reached out and say, Hey, if you know, if you move down, let's get together. He did, we did, right? and a uh, great, great piano player. And so he joined that little trio that I had and has transformed it. I mean, it is so you, fun. Yeah, you sort of implied that last week. I, it, it, I assume this has evolved even more, huh? We played twice this weekend, and oh, wow. um, it's a very different thing. And, and I very consciously, 
The whole exercise is for it to be a very different thing than other musical things that I do. Sure. So I am way less controlling about many things, and including, you know, hey, these are winery gigs. They're pretty laid back. You can use charts if you want. You know, j- you know, come bring what you bring. And uh, some of the guys are, are, are sticklers for parts as they are written. Some of the guys are just using the space. And I posted a video from something we did we did yesterday and I'm just so happy with it. So, the, you know, that conversation, the, the bass player and the keyboard player had a conversation about a, a, about a clash that they heard, which is, that's a good conversation. Yeah. That's, but, that's good um, to notice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But, um, but other than that, it's just, you know, guys with good big ears, enough of a foundational shared foundation of the music that you listen to and like that when you do go into your own part, uh, there's a certain familiarity to where it's coming from, and I, I don't, is that does that sound weird to you? Or do you understand no, what I'm saying? Like, like, I know what you mean. We all yeah. listen. We all basically grew up listening to the same music and have a have a have a at least some people more than others have a have a passion for this type of music. Yeah. And um and I just it's really fun for me just to hear what guys do with it, and uh, you know they're just good players who you know they get out of the way and let me sing my stuff and. They add a lot to it, and when it's their time to shine, they step up, and it's just a really good situation, really easy, too, like low-maintenance guys, and, and That's great. it's just been fantastic. Yeah, it's been really super. That's good. Actually, it changed my enthusiasm for playing music down here. You know, I, I've been sharing, like, I'm not quite not quite getting there, you know, after two years of doing it, and uh, th- I think that my feels like it's something pretty special. It's like there's a lot of, you know, retired rock bands you know just say and of all different skill levels some of them are good some of them are are not that good and um but this one you know just has a sound and we're playing a repertoire that again is i choose it's very different from what the house rockers do and so sure. it's just different stuff so it's working for me right now like to the point getting me really excited to try and you know work more with these guys yeah that's great that's exciting yeah, man feels yeah. good we um it fl- we fling uh, so band number two for me in this, in this episode, <laughs> uh, we played our, we played at the stone church, uh, in new market, New Hampshire last, uh, this past Friday night. Video. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Some of the videos have been making it out. We, it wound up being our, our EP release show for uncorked, as I mentioned in the last, last episode. And it was one of these gigs that came together at the very last minute. I think I mentioned that in the, in the thing. I I have a a thing where where my Facebook Messenger does not uh, notify me in like like I would get notifications for text messages. It, it just I don't know the way I have it set up, and I don't get a lot of Facebook Messenger messages, uh, so I don't worry about that too much. My advice to all of us out there is whatever and and and, and Dan, you know I'm looking at you. Um, that gig would not have happened if I were not if I didn't happened to see my Facebook messenger in a, mm. you know, two hour period on a Thursday night when, when Chip, our, our friend, my friend and a listener here. So thank you, Chip, uh, texted me and said, Hey, you know, th- this, the, the headliner, uh, isn't able to do the gig or is fling able to do it. We obviously made it happen. And, uh, it was a great gig, uh, all, all around uh, low falutin, which is Chip's band that, that opened the night sounded great. They played some, some great covers. In fact, they, they played a version of working man, which they, uh, which they said was for me, which I really appreciated. Uh, cause I, you don't get to see rush covers much, yeah. you know, out there and then fling played and man, it was so perfect. We wound up setting up across the stage. Drums were stage left keys, stage, right. And, uh, bass was in the middle. And then the two guitars kind of on either side. And we had all the vocal mics, uh, in line, which meant I could see everyone and everyone could see everyone. Um, and it also meant that I didn't have a flat wooden wall directly behind me. So drums weren't bouncing off the wall behind me back into my vocal mic. Uh, the, the mix, the ears mix that, that I had on stage is one of the best mixes I've ever had. Uh, on stage anywhere. It One just, of those Nirvana nights, man. It was, no, it was great. And I, and I mixed my own ears. I, I, and I don't mean to take credit for the, the, the quality of the mix. What I'm, the reason the mix was good was because the, the sound in the house, the gains were set right. Everything was dialed in. Well, 
I had good sounds to work with to just, you know, get my levels set um, yep. in my ears. And harmonies especially, they were so much better than we deserve them to be uh, in mm-hmm. terms of the amount we rehearsed and fling. I mean, there were, we were, and, and I mean, these are songs that we've rehearsed. It wasn't like we were just doing this off the cuff, right? But even still doing, you know, three and four part harmonies all night long. And most of them, like doing the gig, I'm like, man, these are like, everything's just locking in. It was comfortable and confident all night. And then listening back to the the videos, it's like, yep, they were just as good as I thought they were. It's like, man, how, like, how fortunate am I that I get to play and sing with, with all these great bands? I mean, you know, I had Bitter Pill today, I had Fling last week. So it was good. Uh, Uptown celebration uh we had two people quit this week so that wait wait Paul, let me pause i'm just gonna give a thought about <laughs> sure because I, I really want you told me you're gonna talk about uptown so yeah, yeah um you know those nights like you're talking about with flink um playing music is kind of like playing golf like one out of every x times things go all everything goes right yeah and it sustains you, yes. you know, through through many bad rounds of golf, at least, right? Yeah. As you kind of bounce your way, you just, you play for those nights when it all is butter. So I, I'm really I, happy you got that. I, it was I such am an too. important night for you guys. It was an important night in, in so many ways. And I think, you know, we've done uh, several, the, the few gigs that we've done leading up to this have all been acoustic gigs. And I, I, I know that that helped, uh, especially on the, on the harmony side, but also just in the, sort of dissecting our song side and, and it, and also me listening to our entire catalog of recorded music, you know, last weekend when I was doing that drive down and back to Connecticut, uh, I think also helped because you know, it, it familiarized me with the tunes, gave me some confidence and uh, you know, all of that stuff. But those, those acoustic gigs where you can really hear everything and everything's exposed, especially vocally really, you know, helps us because we're, we're yep. we, we are confident singing together as long as we can hear each other and we went into this gig and we could all hear and it was great. There were no guitar amps on stage. I will point out both Mike and Russ went direct. And so I, I, so I, I wonder it's interesting if that, that you if talk that about helps. the need to hear each other. I get that, yeah. but I'll give you the other side of it. I, there's one band that is in the Bay area that um, they had a night where something happened. They didn't have any monitors. Right. Yeah. And, and they were spot on. Right. Sure. And when I talked to them, talk to one of the guys he was like well you know literally as long as i can hear the chord and i know my note um you know i'll take care of my business and i trust that my my other guys who are good singers also will take care of their note and so you know you can feel it in your body yeah. when you're out of pitch right absolutely absolutely no and i've had those nights and and then heard recordings back and it's like oh yep look at that you know aaron was where he was supposed to be mike was where he was supposed to be jamie's where he was supposed to be and it all sound, you know, whoever was mixing the the house made it so that you could actually hear that the four of us were all where we were supposed to be. And it was fine. But that's different than blending together. I like I, I mean, sort of I, I you know, Aaron and I, especially we've been singing together for a long time and, and we just know each other. So I, like, I guess if we couldn't hear each other, we'd probably still blend fairly well. But there is something, I mean, it's certainly more enjoyable to be able to hear the people with whom yes. I am singing. I, you know, I think it's really I important, but I also, I, and, and maybe that's what it is that, that joy and, and the confidence knowing I think it's working versus it's definitely working. That, there's, that's a, that's a I different that. vibe. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? I would, I would agree with that. But yeah, yeah you're I, right. I was, I was oversimplifying the problem. No, no, but, but there is something to be said for that. Like some, because sometimes you're not going to be able to hear the way you, you need to, you would like to hear. And so you hear the way you would need to hear, which is you and the bass, you know, for, for me, it's the bass. Like that gives me my, my harmonic reference. And, and then it's like, yeah, okay, well, I'm just going to sing and trust that the other guys are doing their job. And, um, and I, and in, you know, and actually in all the bands, I mean, I, I'm, I'm able to trust because we have good singers everywhere. So yeah, it's good. I'll, uh, I'll talk about, about Uptown in a minute, because because I I I want to ask you about a specific thing. The next thing that I want to do though is talk about our sponsor, which is Banzoogle, and and I want to start by congratulating Banzoogle members. We all uh, have surpassed a hundred million dollars in commission free sales of music, merch, and tickets through all of our websites. And I say our because 
Fling uses Banzoogle. I know, Paul, you with the House Rockers we use do. Banzoogle. They make it super easy to build a fantastic website and online store for your music in minutes. And all the features that you need are already built in. Things like dozens of customizable templates that make it super easy to create your look without knowing how to do the hard work to actually make something appear on the web, right? And and then in addition, the hard work of figuring out how to like sell things and how to put up an online store, they, they've already done that. So you have all the tools to sell your music, your merch and tickets, all commission free and mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters. I can tell you that there were people at the fling gig on uh, Friday night that came because of our Banzoogle mailer that we were able to send out super easy to all of them. They've got integrations with Bandcamp, SoundCloud, YouTube, Bands in Town, and more. So you can add your content from your other online profiles, and they've got live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Plans start at just $8.29 a month, which includes hosting and your own free custom domain name. And because you're a Gig Gab podcast listener, you can go to bandzoogle.com, you try it free for 30 days, and then use the promo code GIGGAB, that's all one word, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. So that's Banzoogle.com, promo code GIGGAB, and our thanks to Banzoogle for doing what they do, making it so easy for us to do what we do, and, you know, for sponsoring this episode. So, yeah. And actually, they've probably been our longest time sponsor over this eight years that we've had a run. They've been on with us on and off many yeah. times over the years. Yeah. I, I, I think that's correct. I mean, it's a perfect fit. Like they, they, they yeah. do a perfect thing for all of us. It's, it's great. Yep. So yeah, super happy to have them. So yeah, yeah with, Zoogle. with, uh, yeah, I love Ben Zoogle. Thank you. Yeah. Um, with, with uptown this week, our keyboard player, uh, decided that the vibe of this band was not for him. And I, I respect, in fact, for both of the people that quit, I respect their reasons for, for, for bailing out. I, I totally get it. Um, it, the vibe of a wedding band is a very different thing from, you know, a, a regular cover band or certainly an original band. I mean, it, a, a wedding band is, it almost is like in a sense, a pickup band, a, a high quality pickup band, uh, it, not in that the, the members change all the time, but the songs change all the time and you often don't or won't have the opportunity to rehearse the, you know, the, 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 the daddy daughter dance and the mother son dance and the first cake, whatever, you know, the cut the cake dance or whatever, you know, all the, the songs that are added, you got to just be able to, to talk about confidence in your bandmates. You, you know, we get a YouTube video or something. And it's like, this is the version we're going to play. It's like, okay, learn that version. And the first and on, sometimes only time you play a song is, you know, live when it matters to those people out there. But they're the ones that matter. It's not about us as the band. You know, we're there to put on a show. Certainly there's times that the spotlight's on us, but it, the gig is not about us. It's whoever's party it is. And, um, and, and so he, it, it just, it was not going to be his vibe. And, and he said, look, you know, I don't want to string everybody along. Like this isn't going to work. I was like, okay, that's fine. And then Rachel, our, our female singer said, you know, I'm going to take this opportunity. I, I've been sort of thinking about this. Uh, I, I don't know that I can commit the time that this band needs. She's playing in this other band, um, an eighties cover band called girls just want to have fun. And, you know, she had told us that that needed to be her priority. And she was worried about uh, the commitment that uptown was going to require from her and how that was carving out time um, from her, uh, from this other band. So she said, you know, I think I'm, I'm out. I, I think, especially with Rachel, if, if we had a gig and we needed, uh, uh, you know, her to be our, our quote unquote sub or something. Uh, and if she was available, I think she'd do it. Like, I, you know, she's a great singer and I think she enjoys what she does with Uptown. She just didn't have, didn't want to commit that time. And one of the things that I think was the issue was we, uh, we had started down the path that I've seen in other bands and I've seen it fail in other bands, this idea of blocking out dates, finding everybody's availability for the year, right? You know, which is easy to do. Like for now, things change as we all know, our schedules evolve, things happen. 
But finding everybody's avails and then saying, okay, we're going to block these specific Saturdays for uptown gigs. And I'll be honest when, when this concept came up, I was like, oh, okay. But I, I, I probably should have said something earlier, but I, you know, I, I, I just try to be Dave bang drum in this band. And I was like, okay, you know, whatever. It's fine. It's not actually going to work. Cause I've, I've never seen it work in any band that I've tried it, but sure. Whatever. You know, I watched it try and happen in, in ghetto fabulous years ago. It was part of what cratered that entire band. Uh, technically in fling, we have Saturday or some dates blocked, but We've never played a gig on those dates because that's not how life works, right? You know, well, you, you're going to hate me on this day. Okay, well, I, I, right, but my experience with it has been, and and this is, I mean, true of the two bands, well, three if you count Uptown, although it doesn't really count, is you know you reserve the dates, but then what actually happens is the, you know, the the call comes in for a gig, it the, the request is for one of the dates that's not on the reserved list. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the text messages go out. Hey, is everybody available? Yes, we're all available. Okay, great. Then you take the gig, right? You, you know, that's that's how gigs work unless you're four-walling your own events. So this idea of reserving these specific Saturdays, especially with Uptown, which is a band that, uh, you know, basically, I mean, we we did take a break for COVID. In fact, I thought I'd said on this show, I thought that band was over. And then Gary was like, oh, let's rekindle it. So it's a band that's essentially starting up to reserve all these dates with nothing booked. And now we have, we're starting to get some stuff booked. So it's fine. But it's like, yeah, it's just un, unrealistic because that's just not how it, things work. So, uh, so I think well, I, I know that that's part of how I think that's part of what, what, you know, drove Rachel out. Cause she didn't want to reserve these dates for no good reason. If she had gigs, I think it would have been yeah, on those dates. It would have been different. So, um, so, but so you, you have some band, thoughts about this. Yeah. Well, I mean, two things. One for that band, which is a special event band specifically, you don't do public Correct. festivals and you don't Correct. So that, that is a challenge situation for that. What was the agreement for the release date? If you're not booked 30 days in advance, 60 days in advance, the proposal you're not going to get a wedding 60 days in advance, well, right? Right. The proposal was 14 days, two weeks. Oh my like, gosh. Like what? That doesn't make any sense. Nobody's going to book us for their sense. wedding in two weeks. That, yeah, like, that doesn't make sense. No, it would be like 60 days m- maybe. But even that, like why bother holding the date? We don't know when, so- we, like let's hold the date when somebody tells us they're having their wedding and they're considering us. Like, okay, that's a good time to hold a date, you know, to make sure it's it, like, it's a fit. Uh, so yeah. the house rockers. We've done know, away again, with this our, policy, by the way. So it's. it's, it, it's well, over. it defeated itself, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So the house rockers. A little different situation because we do a lot of public gigs. So totally different uh, situation. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. Com- that complete. Like like I said, for special events, I can't see how you could how a leader could expect people to hold those dates when it's musicians who want to work elsewhere. Right. If it's everybody who's just on an at will, you know, good. But you know, the, the likeliness of a of a special event coming in less than thirty or sixty days. I know that like um, one of these online gig salad or something like that. Yep. All I get from the, those types of things are within 30 days. I mean, it's constant. And I actually, I've never been able to take one. I've never gotten a gig. For, I, I can't even remember the one that we use. It's not Gig Salad. It's another one. Um, I've never been able to take advantage of one of the leads because we're never available within 30 days. So, Right. Anyway, so for the right. House Rockers, I think I've shared this before. That is actually how I run the band now. Is I say in about November of the previous year, here are the weekends I'm booking for the House Rockers. Sure. One one weekend a month, January through April. Two weekends a month, May through September. Please hold these. The essence of the agree- the tacit agreement in our band is that you'll respect this process. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and then I s- share, I do have a 24-year you know, track record of filling dates, Right. you know, you know, we have great repeat business from these fairs and festivals we do. And so, you know, when the offers come in and I start in October saying, all right, we're going to have a busy calendar. We have limited availability here. The dates who wants dates now. And I just start funneling requests into those things that works. And then in the winter, you know, I booked a, I had booked, (laughs) we're going to talk about our club dates, but I booked club dates, you know, for the Saturday nights and, you know, I have good relationships with the clubs and I know I can book those dates and it's done. So, so that reserve this weekend for me, and, um, it's not actually said explicitly, 
But, you know, if someone was to ask, it'd be, you know, like 60 days in advance is, yeah. I think, plenty of time for someone to fill it with something else. These guys, I have three or four guys who are doing like solo things now. And, and, and everybody seems good with that. Same with rehearsals. Like the rehearsal schedule goes out way oh, in advance. Well, rehearsal schedule is easy because, because it's just you, the band, right? So no, 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 it, no I agree. I'm just saying yeah. like, like planning in advance and asking people to hold dates is actually how I run the band now. Yeah. Now I do have one guy who's, um, who's challenging <laughs> this process. Okay. Uh, a, a, like a couple of dates that are booked. He's let me know he's not gonna be able to make the dates. And I, I think I told you that I sent the band a, a long state of the band note at the end that we use Slack. Yeah. A long state of the band. And I said, the essence of the agreement in this band is that I'm asking you to, to you know, hold these dates. I have a track record for filling them. If you cannot agree to this, let's have a talk now and it'll, and let's, you know, be cool about it. We'll work something out or, or we'll part ways, but we'll part ways amicably. We'll figure but, it out. You know, yeah. it's not fair and I've always said this as long as I've had the band. I can't have a 10 piece band with, you know, each week a guy thinking subjectively whether whether he wants to honor the commitment of the gig that we've accepted, right? And I've also shared I spend a lot of time promoting the individual personalities in my band. They have gotten fan bases. Sure. And that's been a part of me wanting to get, you know, an audience committed to the band. Right. That's yeah. a two way street for a leader because, you know, if a guy leaves, he take, might take that audience with take, him. Takes the audience with him. Sure. Absolutely. But no. it's up to us to keep I, being great with whoever we sub the guy with or replace the guy with. So, so the, the concept of a two way street is something I want to talk about in a little bit more when I talk about this club that we're having, have had some finality with, but, but I actually do run the band again, public gigs, very different. I can't see how you could do that in a private gig. No, what, you, what you're you describing. Have a pool. Yes. I, I mean, I, I suppose there will be exceptions that prove the rule here. Right. But, and, and I, I, we'd love to, I would love to hear about them. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. You know, what do you do in your band? How do you make sure you are carved out for this? I mean, it, it you know, and, and one could be the, you know, the extreme that like, Adam in the van band does where there's subs for everything. And so he just books and he knows his confidence comes, I believe from knowing he's got a pool of people to pull from, to assemble this gig together, you know, by hook or by crook. doesn't matter. We're going to make uh, Adam famous. We are. I know. Yeah. If he, if he's not already, he should I think be. He he already is. Yeah. I, I really do want to have him on the show. Cause he just seems like a fascinating guy. Yeah. The, but, the difference but, would be like, like I, like I, I, the way you do things, you might also be the exception that proves the rule too, right? Like, but you're doing it with public gigs, which as I think I know we, because we've said it, we both agreed, like that's very different than trying to do that with a club band, but you're also an established thing. You, you've got right. gigs on the calendar. You're not, you're not it, like, I don't think it's the way to start a band up because it's, it's just impossible to predict well, when people impractical. are going to want to book you. It's impractical. Yeah. Thank you. The only thing that you have is, and, yeah. and I know we've had several corporate gigs that happen every year. Yes. That they may not be able to book us on the first of the year, but you know, if I send out a, this is likely to come in and yeah. it's got, you know, evidently, you know, it's a three, four, five, six hundred dollar gig for a guy it's worth your time to hold off on this if the leader has a track record of closing the business and, well, know, and there's, working. Well, so. and there's a difference between holding a date for a booked or even pending gig. Like, we get those a lot with Uptown where somebody says, we're getting married on, you know, uh, July right. 27th. We're considering three bands. Uh, would you be available? And so that's when you ask and answer that question. Are you available? That's when the it, it's penciled into the calendar. And, and then can you send us your EPK and, you know, all of the stuff that you do for a wedding, yeah. what's it going to cost? And then maybe we do an audition for them where we wine and dine them a little bit and, and, and schmooze them. And, and then, you know, they sign the contract and, and then it's locked or sometimes they don't sign the contract. Uh, but yeah. you know, but like in that scenario, it makes perfect sense to hold the date because there's actually a thing that someone else has expressed interest in booking us. The yeah. idea of holding a There's date. There's some reality to the date. The, right. There's, yeah, that's totally different than this yeah. idea of, of just holding dates in, in the ether. It, it doesn't like, if there's no reality, I guess that's really what it is. If there's no reality to it, if there's no, well, I, let's hold this date because I know I can likely book us here. I mean, you ask people to hold dates 
Well, let me ask you this. Of all the dates that you uh, that you asked people to hold for y- y- this year, uh, well, let's last year. Let's use reality uh, in our example here. How many of those dates did you wind up not working the band? Last year, I don't think we were quite as much on that process. We're you know okay. still kind of coming out of COVID. Oh yeah, we took a little fair. bit more. But but I in would a say normal year, I, how many I dates did not, do you drop? Does the do, do, get dropped be, because you just couldn't find something to fill it? Well, remember, dropped is is like I will tell the guys about 60, 90 days before the sure. summer starts. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty much done. Okay. Right? Very right, different. I'm pretty much done. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead and do what you're going to do. And then, like you said, something comes in, and yeah, send it around. If it's a good enough payday, guys with solo gigs decide whether it's okay to, you know, trade a, a solo date with someone else and or do whatever it takes. And that's worked pretty good. We've had a couple things that we couldn't take, sure, because we couldn't get a critical mass of a band together. Yep. Um, but it and seems that happens. to be working. That's normal, right? Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. So and, it's, you know, I have so to demonstrate a, as, maybe, as a leader, maybe single digits per year. It sounds like, I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but just to answer my own question, it sounds like single digits per year. Yeah. Are, are you asking people to hold even with a 90 day out, you know, and then, and then it falls through. So I, I think that's, I think that's right. Okay. Well, yeah. that's very it, different than, but, you know. but there's a dotted line to this. And the dotted line is, where is everybody's tolerance for it? So if this is someone's only gig, mm. right? If, 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 um, if Uptown is the only gig that someone has and they keep seeing opportunities coming and going because not everybody else is available, that creates a thing oh, yeah. sometimes. Oh yeah. Right? yeah. So, you know, it's, it's having everybody on the same page, which I think we probably talked about in episode one that we didn't put on the air. It was like, <laughs> like the most important thing is, is you know, the, is everybody have the same agreement and is it tacit and is it clear, you know, here's the time commitment. We are all committing to this. Here's how we're going to handle as many different situations as we can. Like I said, in my, in my band, I have one guy who's messing with my system. Sure. And there's always going to be um, that guy. The only reason well, you only have one guy is because you don't have me in your band. I'd be messing with your system too. You know, it's just who but I, I said, I'm not I, proud but, of this. but even if it was you, I would have said, well, as I shared, Here's the system. This is the basic agreement we're all operating on. Right, right. Like your your commitment is your commitment. I'm asking for these dates. I have a track record. If you can't do it, that's okay. Let's look at each other. But it can't all be your choice as to what gigs you're going to take and what gigs you're not going to take. And so, you know, let, let's have a discussion about this, right? And, uh, you know, I think that that's fair. I think, I you think know, that's, very that's fair. part of being a leader is herding cats and getting people to reminded what, what commitment means. I told you, like, for years... When I got all my horns from a big band, uh, and they they're like salty, you know, experienced horn players, right? <laughs> they didn't look at being in a band as being in a band. They looked at it as, hey, you know, it's just charts. Someone can read it down. And I was like, no, no, no. I can no. sub I it out inter- anytime I want. Yeah, I, exactly. exactly. I'm like, no, no, no. I keep introducing you on stage. I'm trying to get people to know you. Plus, it's never quite as good. Plus, we have some charts that are, you know, a little hard to read down. Plus, we have some flow yeah, to our show. This isn't a theater gig. This is exactly right. I mean, a theater gig, it's almost expected. The charts, the chart. There, there are some theaters. There's one, I think, over in Concord. I think it's in Concord. Uh, I've never played there, so I, I can't say for certain. But as I've been, as I've heard, the rule is. You as a musician never sub a gig. If you agree to a run, whatever that run is, you play, you are agreeing that you will play every show, not that you will f- make sure every show is played. Which is the the the, the latter is the, sort of the standard agreement. Like, okay, yeah, I, I take it. I you know, and I'll sub it out. I'll find somebody if if there's a date I can't make, and that's totally fine as long as it's totally fine with you know as long as your your. Uh, nomination for a sub is approved by the music director, which right. is reasonable, you know, but, but, um, but yeah, your band is, is, is different from, from a theater gig or, you know, any yep. other. Yeah, that's right. Makes sense. So, so I saw this thing on Facebook, Paul, can I, can, <laughs> can I take us there? Uh, Let's go, man. Just a couple hours before we recorded this, I saw a thing where you mentioned a club that you've been playing for a long time. I think I even sat in with you for a little bit at this club once, uh, or maybe more than once. And, uh, in Los Gatos where you used to live and you've even talked about this on the show, but, but what you, you wrote in your note on the house rockers page on Facebook was much more final than anything you had ever said here on the show, which is we are 
you know, for now ending our relationship with this club, it's just not the right fit for us. What happened? Uh, so there's a few things I want to talk about. And the first thing I want to talk about is this is usually uh, stuff we talk about when the, when the, when the red light is off, by the way, folks. So this is, right. you know, I would ask this question anyway, but because you put it publicly on Facebook, I, I assumed that it was okay to talk about it on the show. If I'm oh, wrong. Absolutely. Okay. I, right. No, I want to talk about it actually. Okay. And, and, and the first <laughs> the part about this is ready is, to be ground. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sort of, but actually more, it's about a very conscious understanding of the concept of leverage. Like it was oh. a calculated decision to actually, instead of just taking the things off my calendar, it was a calculated decision to say, uh, we're not going to do these things. And, you know, I hope people will read it because I was fairly, you know, I've been media trained in my life. I was fairly yes, judicious about saying, about saying, hey, we've had a great run there. It's just not the right place for us anymore. Never say never in the future. Um, but, you know, it's not the right place for us. And, you know, thanks to everybody who's come to see us over the years. In the city. So I just, I want to start by saying it was not a, a fit of anger or vengeance that led me to that. It was actually a very calculated move. And the calculated move is this. Oh, it didn't, it didn't feel angry or, or manipulative. It felt, um, final and, and it, it oh. felt, it, it felt informative because I know plenty of your fans have gone to see you and come to expect to see you on a regular basis at that particular club. That's right. So, um, I, it, it was intent intentional to share that and share that away. And in my mind, you know, your, your relationship with, when you earn an audience, that relationship is a sacred thing. And we talk a lot about what is your brand here. And I think, in large part, my brand is accessible and I think we're trusted. And so if we say something like, we're not going to do that anymore, people will hear it and, and get a very intentional message. And you read the comments and it's you know pretty much what I, what I had anticipated would happen. A lot of people saying, good for you, stand by your ground. And someone, someone put a comment that said, whoop, someone ticked somebody off. And so, you know, there is a between the lines about this, but again, it was very intentional. And you could say that airing your dirty laundry is just not a good business practice. Yeah. And writing say, a song about other people airing their dirty laundry <laughs> turns out to have been a fantastic business practice for one go. Don Henry. Very lucrative. Very lucrative. Yeah. <laughs> and Taylor Swift over. And oh, over and over, over, and over yeah. again. That's true. She's made a career of this. That's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Anyway, um, <laughs> Alanis Morissette I, took a swing at it and, and hit that out of the park too, by the way, but you know, there you so. go. A whole album. And then she yeah. made an acoustic, right? Yeah. That's so, right. um, <laughs> anyway, love, it was intentional as the I first love doing one. This and show and when you, I, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I definitely wanted to send a message to the people who follow us that like, you know what? We take where we play seriously and we want you to come to see us in places that we think are a good place for you to enjoy us right and i think for the average person reading between the lines would be would say again because we have 24 years now of spending a lot of time and energy talking to the people who come to see us getting to know many of the people who come to see us chatting with it you know answering facebook replies that type of thing and that creates a brand and a brand is something you caretake and so being honest that you know this is not going to be a good environment um Take from that what you will. You know, we're not going to go into the dirt. Right. But take from that. And, you know, I think for our for our brand, that transparency and honesty held a lot of value. Does that make sense? It 100% did. Yeah. I, I mean, I know you. It was immediately obvious who wrote the post for the House Rockers. I mean, I, I assume you read <laughs> all of them anyway. But, I mean, I know you. And I know that that you have been media trained. Um, you know, you and I've been through some interesting things together over the years, uh, over the decades, where we've we've needed to leverage some of that. So it was like, ah, yes, there's lots between the lines here that will never be shared publicly. And I'm, I, you know, I didn't come into this asking for dirty laundry, or at least no more dirty laundry than has already been shared. But yeah, it's, well, it's we're, we're gonna. I'm actually gonna go into what happened because I okay. think it's, it, oh. there's a good story there. Right. But I will tell you that in the couple hours since I posted that, I've had eight bands, you know, say what's going on, mm. right? 
And I said, I'm actually going to do a podcast about it tonight. So, oh, so you know, that's I, a I'll, way to I'll see. talk to my friends. That's yeah. the media. And I and actually there, sent yeah. this all went down last week. Yeah. And I called the two or three closest bands to us um, and just kind of shared. And so let me explain what happened. So this is a, a, a venue that we've had a 10-year relationship with. Yeah. Uh, the original guy who owned it 10 years ago, he was um, – just getting back into the live music business. I think I've shared this in the past. He offered, he was really weary about whether he could make money on, on music as a bar. Right. And it's a bar that his father actually owned. So it actually been in the family for a long time. And he had shared with me, you know, I kind of grew up in high school, you know, when I got to college, me and my, my buddies were the bouncers at this bar. You know, it's, it's a big part of my family's history. It meant a lot to me to take it on, but I don't know if live music is a thing anymore. Everybody else is doing DJs. And, um, and I remember said, I, this I, was the I, place where they would like have you play the early slot and then a DJ would come in for the late slot sometimes. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, anyway, he offered us a fairly low stipend and I said, how about this? I'm pretty confident we're going to bring a lot of people here. How about if we play for the door? And he was flabbergasted at the idea that he wouldn't have to pay and have the liability even as low as it was for live music. And we crushed it, and we crushed it for many, many years. And I think over time, to be honest, you know, he probably he was he was always very cordial. But I think he probably was like, well, I don't know if I should have made that deal in hindsight oh, here. But you know, uh, he never went back on the deal, and that and okay. that actually is That's that is the thing. main part of this story. He never went back on the deal. All right, uh, the bar changes, and hands. he could have, like, he could have said, hey, you know, we we like not not. Going back on it, I mean, he could have done anything and, and you know, then let the chips fall where they may. But he could have said, hey, we've done this deal for a couple of years. I need to change the deal. Are you still interested? And maybe maybe that's what you're about to tell us happened. I don't know. Buckle up, bud. So, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, the, the, the venue changes hands. And we actually played the grand reopening party coming out of COVID. It changed hands during COVID. And we played the grand reopening party and over, I mean, it was huge. This was the, you know, the guy had, had tried a different format and had a bad partner or something like that. And, and the format that he ran for several months just wasn't getting there. And um, he wanted to go back to the old format of what he bought. And so he called and we had several conversations and um, we were the band that did his grand reopening party, and we did great. So over time, but the night we played that party, <clears throat> service was awful. Um, uh, uh, the drink prices had gone up, um, and you know the seating was changed. We got a lot of, lot of, lot of complaints from our regulars oh. that it's not the same place anymore. Okay, so this starts. This starts a spiral, right? Yep. Uh, over, so that was what, 21? Okay. Can't remember. Yeah. We've been playing in 21 or was it 22? Well, we've been playing in the winter of 21 or are we on lockdown? It's in the no, of it's possible. I mean, right. yeah, yeah, gigs were happening I, in the winter of 21. Yeah, it would have, because the winter of 22 was just like, you know, last month or something. So, right. Yeah. Anyway, over time, there's a pattern starts to emerge where, oh, we're changing the time. And it went from a three-hour gig to a four-hour gig, right? And we're getting the door, right? Okay, yeah. And the time that gets changed is not what we would have recommended for our audience. Now, remember, the essence of this, all bands were taking the door under the new ownership. That means all bands were incented to drive their crowds to these shows. They were bringing their crowds to these shows, right? Yeah. So like I said, over time, little things change. And actually, one night, we actually got bumped. We had a booked gig, and they decided to change the format. And they were like, yeah, sorry, you know, we're going to commit to this format. And our band was wholly ticked off that on short notice, a club bumped us, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, that, I would say that was the moment that things started getting really challenging, right? So... We book um, a few more dates, um, and they are up and down. Our audience coming to the club has definitely changed. Hardcore people, hardcore fans, we would still see, but a lot of the casual people that we would see, like if, if I was to say we would know 
50 to 70% typically, it got down to like 25 to 50%, right? So our, who was coming to see us at this club didn't affect when we did our own four world shows. We still, you know, so yep. it wasn't that our, it wasn't that our fan base was changing. It was that our fan base specifically at this venue was, was changed. You calculate it was obvious, right? Anyway, some great nights, some okay nights. I don't think we had a bad night, but um, I know we had one night that was clearly the lowest draw that we, that, you know, lowest take at the door. Anyway, I get a call and um, I get a call last week, February, asking me how many tickets we've sold for our, for our April date. Now the whole issue of tickets is a bit of a weird thing, right? So we have an audience that for 20 years is used to just coming to the door and uh, we, we, we did some advanced tickets, but we would have great nights and not do very much advanced tickets. And we had a couple of nights where I, I went to the club's credit. They did a couple of things like they had some private areas where, you know, those things people would want to buy in advance. And so that, you know, we were able to make more money on those types of things, but sure. still we were bringing the people right. right Largely right. it was, it was, there's no home base club uh, audience for this. Anyway. So we get a call. Uh, how many tickets have you sold? I said, it's not even up for sale yet. People don't buy tickets as far in advance. Yeah. Well, we're changing the format. No longer do the bands take the door. Uh-huh. Here's our offer for you. So it was an offer, not 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 a terrible offer, but and but and, it was and a just to, just right the change. How how many weeks out was this? How how far out was this? April eighth gig was the next one, and it happened last week. So okay, so uh, let's say two. two let's give let's give them two months. Okay. All right. So uh, it wasn't the time of it. It was the it was the change. It was the it was yeah, the yeah. entitlement to change. And um, and the, the take would have been half of what we would typically take there. Okay, yeah. And I was provided with, you know, like the agreement for this. And the agreement talked about, you know, the impetus to, to, to you know, market the events by the band. And I'm like, you want me to market this for half the money that we would have gotten typically, right? <laughs> like, it was, it, like, to me, it was just a, a, a glaring yeah. issue, right? Yeah, I mean, so I, changing. I, I said, I immediately said when I read this thing, I said, "No, thank you." I said, "We're we're, we're done." Sure. Went back to the band. The band was upside down, pissed off. Yeah. Upside down, like you know, they 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 canceled that one date, honest, and that was on short notice when it was you know they decided to do a a different format on one of the nights, and you know it was like seething, like the service was still not great, you know, our fans weren't enjoying going to this place, but you know, I would say my observation, roughly. 25% of the shows did really well. 75% of the shows, you know, yeah, you know, what the, the bands weren't able to draw there. And the, the common denominator, I believe is the service anyway. Yeah. So our group is, is really ticked off about this and you know, like, yes. And one guy in my group actually posted a much more angry, direct thing, mm. took it down. I didn't ask him to take it down. He took it down. He thought better of it. Sure. And, um, and uh, yeah, but the, the point of this is, um, and some bands will gladly take this new deal, right? Yep. Um, but it's like we talk about, you know, music scenes in every town, right? There's there 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 are four or five piece bands that are taking three hundred dollar gigs because they just want to play, right? Yep. And you can't tell me what to do. And you know, if I want if I want to give it away, I can give it away, and all those types of things. But this this felt like a moment in time, a line in the sand, a principled action. Which I am very fortunate to have a whole band who, at the first sense of being disrespected, is happy to give the middle finger. I mean, literally, yeah. you know, there is there is a radar there that is quite intense. And I feel I, I have learned quite a bit from that because as a leader, I've wanted to take some gigs where they've, you know, definitely called me out on it and said, is, you know, not what, worth it, right? What's the point? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So this is interesting to me because last week... I shared a story about how a club um, mm-hmm. cancel essentially canceled dates without even canceling them, right? Like they just weren't going to happen. And had I not asked, I don't know when I would have been informed of this. And it it was just because they were, you know, completely changing the way the 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 whole venue and the restaurant operates. It's a it's a you know wholesale change. Uh, and I was surprised at how. I was just like, well, yeah, okay, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, it was a pretty low stakes gig. 
Um, but you know, it's a gig's a gig. And I've, I've had some comments this week from folks who are like, you should be more upset about that than you are. I'm like, yeah, no, that's why I shared it on the show. I was surprised. I wasn't upset. So I share that, uh, be well, both to contrast what you're going on with, but uh, what's going on with you, but also to perhaps give some, uh, context to my reactions here, two months of notice to change a deal it could be worse. It's not mm-hmm. great, but it's like, okay, like how much is the right amount? Right. I mean, it, you know, is it, should you honor it for the gigs that are booked? And maybe this is actually the answer. Yes, you should honor it for the gigs that are booked, but don't book any mm-hmm. more when it's time mm-hmm. to book more. That's when you change the deal. If you want to have a relationship with the people, if you just say, here's yes. the new deal, take it or leave well, it, yeah, you, may Dar- get a re- you may get a response that you're not very happy with. Yeah, well, it's the Darth Vader approach, right? It's the, you know, <laughs> I've changed the deal. Uh, so, so yeah, that that is the right time to change the deal is when there's new, new things to book. That said, 60 days isn't awful. If, if they change the deal, compared to if they change the deal, like when you walked in the door, on the night of the thing, like, Hey, I know you sold all these tickets and man, thank you. But, uh, I just want to let you know, here's the new deal, right? Like that would be far worse than what they did to you. But what they did to you is bad compared to waiting until it's time to book the, the next round of dates, whatever that was. How many more dates did do? Did you have booked with this place? You had April. How many past April did you have? One. Oh man, they should have eaten those two dates and then, and then, and then booked and then offered the deal change when negotiating the rest. Yeah. 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 Well, the, yeah I, that, that is the obvious smart thing, but again, you yeah, know, it's not like you had, what, gigs did they, booked. what did they think would happen? Right. What did, what, well, it's not like what, you had eight did, gigs think, booked, right? Like if you had eight gigs booked, then I could see them saying, look, we can't like, this isn't going to, this is untenable. We're changing things. We just got to rip the bandaid off. Now you had, two more gigs booked why would they bother to poke the bear yeah that doesn't make sense to me man i'm i'm actually with you on this one despite being totally fine for whatever reason with the club that i talked about last week i'm 100 percent with you on this that this was stupid. well again you know? they there was yeah. th- this was two months but it was a, you know we yeah, felt it was still blatant and they there's had done two, it once before there's two gigs that's all that's left <laughs> That's all that's left. Like, it doesn't matter that it's two months out. It's just two gigs. It's two nights of their business that they could have just left alone and things would have been, we wouldn't be having this conversation. If, if, if whatever, you know, four or five months from now, they, you know, you, you told me, oh yeah, you know, that, that place we used to play all the time. Uh, they, you know, we, we finished our run there and it's time to book new ones and they wanted to yeah. pr- pay us differently. And so we said, no. That would have been the end of the story. We wouldn't have gone on for right. 20 minutes about it because they weren't changing the deal midstream. Yeah, no, this was stupid. It, this was, I, I think I would say that foolish. the other part of this that is kind of interesting is <clears throat> be weary of people who um, represent that they're doing something good for the local music scene. Um, Some people are though. I mean, it, I, wait, like, wait, wait, let, let me finish the thought. Okay. Yeah. Creating creating low paying mm. gigs in in challenging situations just so people can have a pay, place to play that's speaking to a certain segment of the music scene and I would challenge and say what happens is you're probably going to get bands that you know will take challenged pay yeah and then a good venue becomes an average venue or a, or a mediocre venue and it's not good for the music scene. I, I was so be, be I, careful what people think they know about how the music scene works. Yeah, I was impressed uh with the whole thing that happened with the Stone Church last week. You know, we uh as I said, we were added to the bill with a week to go. The the ticket price had already been set because some tickets had been sold. Now, obviously they, they reached out to everybody who had bought tickets and said, Hey, we've changed the deal, but it's that because, you know, this band is on now unavailable. So this is what the lineup is. Most of the people kept their tickets and we had tons of walk-ups. Uh, they kept the price at 15 bucks, uh, if purchased in advance. And I think 18 or 20 at the door, um, which I think is a fair price for the night. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, unlike that that gig I played in Boston a couple of weeks ago, where they, there were four bands on the bill and they charged five bucks. Five you know, bucks. yeah, what the f like? I'm not doing it again, Paul. We're just we're just, yeah. we're, we're, we're clicking don't, the explicit we're button. Don't look, don't look over your shoulder. You're not going that way. That's right. I'm not going that way. <laughs> but uh, y you know, and at the end of the night, and it it was the attendance was respectable. It was not packed. I've I've packed that place with both Fling and Bitter Pill before. This was not one of those nights. We did not pack it. We told people about this like five days in advance of the gig. You know, like people had plans. In fact, there was a huge hockey game happening on Friday night uh, at the university at uh, UNH. And a lot of people went to that. It sold out that that place has not sold out all year. Right. So there were there were a lot of things. And also it was just short notice, but it was a respectable amount. There were many people that came from our our mailing list, as I mentioned earlier, there were a ton of people that came from uh, seeing it on Facebook and there were quite a few of you listeners to this show who came, which is awesome. So thank you. At the end of the night, they asked us and, and I give uh, chip and the folks in low falutin a lot of credit. They're like, Oh, well, we opened the night. So, you know, you guys decided how to split the money. I'm like, no, no, no. You booked us for this gig. <laughs> like we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. So we split the bill. Well, we split the, 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 the money right down the middle. I'm like that, you know, yeah, we fling played two sets. They played one, but they made the whole thing happen for us anyway. So we split it down the middle. Everybody was happy with that. Everybody wanted the other party to have more to me. That's a perfect scenario. And in, in something like this. So it was like, great. We each walked out of there with 400 bucks. So there was 800 bucks for a, a, a you know, m medium attendance night that, uh, you know, in in the, the terms of of the amount of time we all had to promote it was a huge success. And it was great. Like people, the people that were there stayed till the end and loved it. So it was like, perfect. OK, we entertained. Everybody was good. The club sold a lot of beer and food. Like everything was great. But there was 800 bucks on the table. Um, yeah. There wasn't 800 bucks on the table to split between four bands when we played down in Boston and that club was packed full. Crazy. They definitely, I, I had heard from someone that there were four people that came, heard about the then $20 cover because they were just came to the door and walked away. So there was 80 bucks that, that walked away. Maybe there was more, but if we had charged $5, we would have made way less. Even if those people yeah. made it in I, music's just worth more so than that. I'm music's sorry. worth more than that. And I, I, I <laughs> give uh, Jamie, uh, who is the Jamie Preston, who is the current owner, uh, co-owner of the Stone Church and the one uh, who manages the music side of things there. I give her a lot of credit for encouraging us to keep the prices at 15 and 20 for the night. I, I think she did a great thing. And, and I bring this up because she is someone who really does support the local music scene here and does things that in her mind really will further things along. And for the most part, they do like she, I'm sure she's made some mistakes. I haven't seen them, uh, you, you know, like they, they, they're certainly, if they exist and we all make mistakes. So I'm assuming they're there for her. They are far and few between. She really is, you know, focused That's on great. Yeah. It's great. Oh, it, and especially for that room, that room's got so much history and it's so great to see it ha survive uh, through. There's been get, quite a few things, but anyway, yeah. 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 I would just say, you know, to end this, very informative show and our anniversary mm. show not it, it, resist the temptation to to over over generalize you know nobody is is nobody is just one thing i mean be, people make decisions for whatever reason but but i think that axiom when people tell you who they are believe them and when in, <laughs> in, in, in when it comes to a club it could be a really nice person you know, we talk about, you know, dealing with club owners and oh, again, yeah. you don't want to put all club owners, club owners, paint them all at the same brush. However, if someone demonstrates to you that they think your relationship is fungible, you know, that it can change <laughs> on, you know, if they do it once and they don't overly apologize or, or, or you know, it's not extending situation, you're, you know, buyer beware, you know, if you decide to go in there and say, okay, don't expect that it can never happen to you. And I, and I, and I would say I was guilty of that. We should have we should have called it out the first time because we had such a long track record, and we told ourselves, "Oh, our our fans love to come to this place. It's been our home base. We get yeah. to say we have a home base club." You know, we I, we told ourselves a whole lot of stuff. There, there are undoubtedly guys in the group who, after the the first cancellation, you know, would have been fine to walk away. And I, I actually I know that for a fact. But I'm not surprised that it happened again. I'm just 
ticked off that it happened again. And so yeah. this time, you know, we, you know, say, hey, enough's enough. Um, and, uh, you know, we use the situation to our benefit in the same way they're using the situation to their benefit. To our benefit is to say to our fans, hey, you know what? We, we're a principled group. You know, we want a great environment for you to play. We, and that's where that's where we choose to, you know, perform our music. Hopefully you'll come along and see us. You know, it's, it's been good for all of us so far. So we're going to make a change. And, you know, we'll see how it shakes out. I mean, like I said, I have probably a couple more musicians who called since we've been on the air or since we've been recording here. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there'll be some bounce around. I actually don't give crap. It's a club, right? Yep. We gave everything. We did. A, we, we made them a lot of money over the years. And, uh, and, uh, we made our money. It's a business, you know, they did something that I can't be cool with business wise. We're both moving on. If they want to say, you know, blah, blah, blah about the house rockers, you know, they may do that. I'm pretty confident my relationship with my fan base is based in trust and honesty and, and delivering the goods of giving them and more than anything. I don't know think they want. Those are parts of my brand, but at the end of the day, they want us to play good music and a place yeah. where they feel safe and happy and all those type of things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's my thing. It, it, I mean, I, I will acknowledge that there are two sides to every story. However, I, I can't imagine that if I were to hear the other side of it, that my conclusion on this would be radically different than it is. Like you don't, why, why risk a, the PR of, <laughs> of this? I mean, we just did a 30 minute segment on this. Like we're still here. You did a mm-hmm. post on Facebook that's been seen by hundreds, if not thousands of people. And I, like, this is going to be heard by thousands of people. Like, it's just not, you'll have to go to the show notes, folks, uh, unless Paul wants to say the name of the club. I'm certainly not going to say it. Paul hasn't said it. You can go to the Facebook post. It is linked in the show notes at giggabpodcast.com if you want to learn what the club was. But, uh, but yeah, it, like, what a, what a silly thing. Anyway, thanks for sharing that story. Yeah, good stuff. Well, it, it, it's cathartic. You know to share it, and you know if it helps the anybody axe out there. Has good. been ground, yes. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Again, I, I the part where I started, it has been ground, but there was at least some strategy to the method of doing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Like, you, you didn't know, jump the gun on grinding this particular axe. No. Fair enough. Good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Oh no, I, yeah, I'm I'm with you. Yeah. Well, always be performing. Always. Always. That's what we're doing here. Even when we're ranting about clubs positively and or negatively. Sometimes in the same segment. There are good clubs and there are bad clubs. There are good guys and there are bad guys. That's a great song, by the way. Always be performing, folks. Later. Happy anniversary.